University of Maryland today. Uh, Nora did his uh, PhD at uh, University of Kansas, and then he moved to uh, Caltech at, uh, I, uh, at IPAC, right? right? And um, doing, like, I guess, Spitzer and Brad stuff. That's and right. And now he's uh, uh, at the University of Maryland working on radio observation using common telescope for a virtual uh, right. So he's going to tell us about uh, considerations for observation sites of resolved star of the resolved star. Okay, uh, the basic idea of my talk is to make you guys familiar with a slightly different topic because I've checked the website of CEDA and it seems like that my talk is very remotely connected to, to the <laughs> general audience. Only Norm Murray can go directly head and head uh, with my research uh, interests. So at, um, at Maryland, we are doing a Karma Telescope Survey for a selection of uh, nearby galaxies. If you have heard the word called Bima Song, it's like a complementary CO10 molecular line survey for nearby galaxies. Uh, the idea is to get uh, super duper data and much with much better sensitivity and resolution so that we can do resolved star formation laws. And the result that I'm gonna show you today is from a pilot study that we just started a year ago. And uh, the survey that we were doing in, in uh, Maryland, we call it Karma Sting. Sting, it's, as you know, that we all have to have a super acronym for anything we do these days. So the Sting stands for Survey Towards Infrared Bright Nearby Galaxies. And it's a collaboration uh, with uh, several other people in many different institutes in the US. So starting with the uh, basic idea of star formation law. Many of you are probably familiar with that. <coughs> the simplest form of star formation law tells us that the gas which transforms to condensed object like star, star has connected, has, has the connection, and this connection between these two quantities follow a power law, which is expressed by this Schmidt law. You probably have heard about it as schmidt kennicott law or schmidt sendula kennicott law. The two most important parameters for this law are the A, which is related to star formation efficiency, and the Powell index N, which gives us the nature of the star formation efficiency that I'm going to show you later. In the whole 60s and 70s and 80s, we try to understand the, the nature of N, whether it's a linear or superlinear, meaning whether it's close to one or greater than one. And at, during the time, the idea was that it was in between one to four. But when we have high, higher, uh, better resolution data, starting from last decade, we started realizing that this index has probably much narrower range in between 0.8 to 1.5. But still, it's unsettled whether it's a linear relationship or uh, nonlinear relationship. The reason that is important for us is because if you define a parameter called star formation efficiency, which is the ratio of star formation rate and gas, surface densities, and if star formation rate density follow a power law, you just replace this numerator, and you get a relationship as where the exponent is n minus one. And if, if you flip the star formation efficiency, it gives you a quantity called star formation time scale. It's directly related to the power law index. Now, depending on the nature of n, you can tell about the uh, star formation time scale. If it is one, then star formation is independent of environment. No matter where you look at the disk of the galaxy, star formation is pretty much sens insensitive to that. But if it is greater than one, then it implies that star formation actually decreases as the gas density increases. And this is very extremely important for the theorists like you guys, where <coughs> you try to understand why the star formation efficiency is so low in the galaxy disk and uh, what regulates the star formation efficiencies and the star formation in, in, in the galaxies overall. Especially uh, uh, for this kind of theoretical works, that follows with one school of thought is in Berkeley, led by Christopher McKee and Norm Murray here at CEDA. So the question is, the observational range that we are seeing in N, is it, is it real or there is some kind of bias involved in it? Let me rephrase it. Is there any way that I can 
narrow it down? Or is there any way I can understand this range? And if there are, if there are some ways it exist, what are those ways? So for a long time, we know that if you use different star friction rate tracer with a specific uh, gas, either it could be molecular gas, or it could be atomic gas, or combining the both, your power index will depend on it. And star formation rate trace could be extinction corrected H alpha uh, tracing directly star forming region, extinction corrected uh, ultraviolet, or if you are clever enough to tackle, to know how to tackle your extinction, you combine far infrared with 24 micron or H alpha with 24 micron. No matter which star form rate tracer you use, your power index is extremely sensitive to that. Then we also know that the difference, the range that I've shown to you at the, at the, at the second slide from, from 8 to 1.5, it also depends how you try to fit the data and try to put a constraint in the functional form. Because we have the data and we try to fit the data with some statistical method. How much, what's the chance that statistical methods is giving us some, some range that his, that someone else's result is not consistent with me? And recently it's, uh, it's appearing when we have high resolution data is that when you sample your data in a specific way, your result might be different than mine. And you have to be very careful how you sample it. There are three different ways you know that you can sample the data by pixel sampling, which gives you the finest resolution, few tens of per sec to probably a couple of, uh, probably hundreds of per sec. And then you can go to bigger sampling uh, method by aperture, putting in aperture in a star forming region which, which get, could sample like a few hundred per sec or you go to much bigger uh, sampling uh, zone by using azimuthal average radial profile which can sample like few ten, few hundreds per sec to like kilo per sec range. Just to give you a flavor, I just, I'll just quote two uh, famous results that came out. One is Kenny Gates 2007 paper where he showed that if you take H alpha and 24 micron as your star formation ray tracer and you try to correlate with gas, either it could be atomic gas or molecular gas or both, and you try to sample uh, your, uh, your, your disk by putting circular aperture along the, in the, in the galaxy disk near, uh, on the star forming region, then you get a non-linear relationship between star formation rate and ga molecular gas, gas. On the other hand, if you use the total gas, you get much steeper relationship, which is given by the solid line, and in mole, the red line is given by this dotted line. Now, what you notice is that actually star formation rate has no relationship with, molecular, uh, with atomic gas, this, these blue points. So from 2007, actually, it, it appeared in 2002 from Wungen Bill's Blitz result that actually it is probably the molecular gas which is correlated better with the star formation rate, not the total gas or the atomic gas, but he just reconfirmed it in 2007. And notice that, no, notice a few things. His star formation rate tracer H alpha plus 24 micron. His aperture, sam his sampling is aperture sampling, and he is correlating with molecular gas. Now, in, in 2008, there is another famous paper came out which include much, which, which basically include many uh, nearby galaxies. They pretty much show the same trend that atomic gas has no relationship with star formation ray tracer, where this horizontal dotted line and vertical dashed line have the sensitivity limit along these uh, two axes. And this uh, diagonal line gives you this uh, star formation efficiencies. What they know is the most interesting part here is that when you bring a different star formation ray tracer where you take far infrared, sorry, uh, uh, ultraviolet and 24 micron and combining them uh, both to tackle the extinction and you try to correlate to the molecular gas, you get almost a linear relationship. Yeah? So we are in a puzzle that doesn't tell us exactly what's going on. So the question is, the difference that I'm seeing in these two slides are basically difference, as a, the result of the differences of different star formation ray tracer, statistical method, they definitely, 
I will show you later that they use different statistical methods to feed the data, and they use different data sampling. The, the thing that is, that went untold, that nobody actually paid attention, is, is called the coupling between diffuse component and the star forming regions. So what I mean by that, by this uh, uh, red uh, box, is that if you look at a galaxy image, if you look at a galaxy map, a galaxy map can be split into three components. One is the localized star forming region, forming stars, massive stars. The other is the extended diffuse component which is surrounding it, and the background or foreground of the sky. So if you think a galaxy as a, as, 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 as a, as a system which has meatball and sauce in it, the meatballs are basically your star forming knots, H2 region, and the sauce is the diffuse emission. Now whether or not sauce has the connection with the meatballs, that's the issue, that's the thing that I want to focus for this presentation. Now this diffuse component exists in all bands that we use for tracing star formation rate, starting from ultraviolet to to optical nebular line emission to mid infrared. And diffuse emission, um, you probably have heard the word called Raynor layer, which has been studied for the last 30 years for the Milky Way, which shows that diffuse component has actually much more extended uh, scale length and scale height than, <coughs> than uh, star forming regions. So this, this uh, Raynor layer related uh, property is also known as WIM, I call it D. WIM is warm interstellar, uh, warm ionized medium, or D is a diffuse ionized medium. They have di uh, different properties compared to the properties of the star forming region in terms of density, in terms of temperature, and their distribution. So in general, this component actually con contains 30 to 50% of the total emission of the disk. And this fraction obviously depends on the wavelength. We don't know the region of this, uh, the origin of this diffuse component. It could be leakage from the H2 region, right? It could be faint unresolved H2 region, which we cannot resolve by our current sensitivity and resolution. Or for UV, it could be, you know, important part could be scattered light. Or it could be the field stellar population, not necessarily with, this, uh, with the star forming H2 region. Since we do, know, we do not know the specific origin, of diffuse component, we have to actually be keep very careful in studying the star formation law, which depend on the star formation ray tracer. So giving you a flavor that diffuse component actually exists in all types of galaxies. This is a plot showing uh, optical diffuse emission coming from H alpha image for uh, a selection of local group galaxies. On the top, it says different uh, uh, diffuse fraction as a function of morphology. You see, this fraction varies from 30% to 60% for SA, SB, SC, and irregular, irregular Magellanic type. And looking at the other properties of this, of this galaxy, if you look at the star formation rate, it doesn't matter what type of uh, a galaxy it is, whether it's a quiescent, uh, it's a normal star forming, or an actively star forming galaxies diffuse component is always present for this type of galaxies. And it's for, for this type of, for, 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 for these local galaxies that I have plotted here, they're all, they're in between 30 to 50%. For nearby galaxies, it's easy to, to resolve the H2 naught with the diffuse component. But if you go farther and farther down, then it becomes difficult. But you just use it as your scaling relationship to, to understand the diffuse component of, of uh, yeah, that's that's exactly I'm gonna I'm gonna go to to yeah. So just to to give you a little more f flavor, which we didn't know before the galaxy data, the diffuse component is very notorious and it's persistent. For this uh, M33 disk, Tilker et al. showed that diffuse component actually contains 70 to 80 percent for the entire range of the disk, and these are not related with the star forming uh, knots. These are not related to the clusters. These are some sporadic systems which are you know, giving emission to the entire disk. Likewise, the, the, the diffuse component for H alpha actually also shows a pretty flat distribution. And uh, the range here is approximately like 10 kilo per sec for the M32 disk. So this is, the previous slide was for the, for the disk average diffuse emission for, 
for a optical wavelength. This is for the AFUB, and this is also exists for 24 micron. This is a recent result from uh, Verli et al. using Spitzer data. What they try to show, they, they measure the star forming region, they call it discrete sources, and they plot the fraction of the emission coming from these discrete sources. And, uh, and, and it, it seems like the, uh, the fraction of the emission coming from the discrete sources is going down as you go from the central part to the outside of the galaxies. So if you just flip it, in your, and just use your imagination, if this amount is coming from the uh, discrete sources, that amount is actually coming from the, from the diffuse component. And so at the central part, the, the diffuse component at 24 micron is ap approximately 50%, and at the outer part is approximately 80 to 100%. And this diffuse component is not coming from the coming come directly from the H2 region. These are coming from the AGB stars. The planetary nebula are distributed in a, in a much more complex way. So putting all this together, the reason I'm trying to emphasize on this diffuse component is that when you calibrate your star formation ray tracer, you use H2 region. Now, if those diffuse components are coming from H2 region, you bring them in. If they are not, you remove them, right? So that's the whole idea. And uh, for uh, subtraction or non-subtraction, you use a technique called median filtering. That's how you, there is no unique way to do that. And we don't know any, whether or not any unique way exists or not. So, so the diffuse emission is both in the infrared and the uh, UV as well. And the UV as well. And H alpha. And H alpha. So it makes my, our life a little bit camera And this is what I try to explore for my uh, pilot, uh, pilot galaxy, M, M, uh, M99. I'm going to show you a, a pixel by pixel case analysis on, on, on a specific sampling for H alpha. And I'm going to highlight H alpha, by 24, H alpha plus 24 micron. But eventually, I will bring all the star formation ray tracer to you and try to convince you that it is the diffuse component, which actually has a much more uh, 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 strong grip on the, on the distribution of the, of, the, of, the, of the power law index. So these are some nice, pretty pictures at different wavelengths from M99, which is 16.6 .6 mega per second away, and for each pixel I have 80 per sec resolution. So yeah, starting uh, my, going back to your question, so you take your optical, uh, any image you want, and you, you think that you have a, a diffuse component in it, and you use a technical median filtering, which basically hostile to any peak. So you choose a scale length and you filter it out. That peak is gone. You come up with a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a smooth distribution. And you try to be consistent because when you try to make a radial plot of, this, of these three guys, it has to look at least qualitatively similar to the actual distribution of the diffuse component that has been done by many other people for M33 or and the Milky Ways. So let's assume that I have found a technique called median filtering, and, and that that's the way I can generate my diffuse component. And I, since I don't know my, uh, what the actual amount of diffuse emission present in my disk, I have to explore all the possible ranges, right? So I just give you three different representative numbers. For, for, for the first case, DIG has the, the, this smooth image, actually. This image contains 55% of the emission coming from here. So this is actually dominant. When D can dominate, D can you know, moderately dominate, or D can be subdominated on that. So what you do, you subtract this medial row from your original row, and then you assume, again, this assumption involved, that whatever you are having here is coming entirely from your register region to be consistent with your start from a uh, tracer calibration. And then you go and do the same thing for 24 micron. You do the same thing for your FUB also. And depending on your interest, how you want to <coughs> devise your star formation rate, uh, rate, uh, star formation rate tracer, you either use FUV plus 24 micron, H alpha plus 24 micron, or extension corrected H alpha, or extension corrected FUV, and so on. So with this methodology, I'm just trying to give you a little, little uh, I'm just trying to be a little more detailed to make you familiar with that so that you feel more comfortable. So I have assumed that diffuse emission has no connection with the H2 region. And uh, my star formation ray tracer is based on H2 region. So I have to remove it, and I use median filter. And I chose a range of median filter 
which will give me some diffuse uh, emissions. I call it dominant, significant, subdominant, negligible, depending on the, on the range I, I prefer to have. With this assumption, if you generate your Smith can you get low plot? It's a, it's a, it's a plot showing uh, each uh, molecular hydrogen versus star formation rate, tracer given by H alpha plus, plus 24 micron. Here, the tracer map contains the dominant diffuse component, 55% of the total emissions, which I have removed because it doesn't relate it to my star formation rate tracer. And the distribution look like this. This the, 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 the different contrast level are actually representing different uh, amount of uh, a fraction of points. The most important thing that I would uh, uh, like you to pay attention to is the, the spread along this x-axis. So this is a qualitative picture. What happens when my diffuse component is dominant and I've subtracted, I come up with a small amount, 45% of the total emission, which is coming from the H2 region. Now you play with your uh, median filter and you generate another diffuse component map and subtract it and you say it. So now I have 45% of the total emission. The spread changes a little bit, not much. But if I generate another map and do the same thing where I have only 30% of the total emission and subtract it, so now I have my emission as 70% and the spread actually changes significantly, right? And if you have uh, experience with feeding, you know that the, since the, the, the distribution along the y axis is changing, right? Whenever you, whenever you try to go to feed, the feed will also change. And that will give you a different amount of power low indices that I'm going to show in a second. So these are the quantitative, uh, qualitative pictures. So, 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 so to, to put some number in it, let's go back to the first image and feed it. You'll be surprised if you start doing it. You'll, you'll, you'll be surprised to know that when you have uh, X and Y, and when you have X and Y, both has error bar in it. There is no unique solution to it. So someone has, has given me a number A, and someone has given, another one has given me a number B but after feeding two different techniques. If they are not consistent, there is no reason, there is no way you can compare them. So these are the four different feeding methods I just tried to pull from the literature, which are known, re reasonably known, and used in our star formation law studies. And you see that for one distribution, specific distribution, the power index given by this different feeding ranges from 1.2 to 1.9. So it's mildly linear to extremely non-linear. So which one will you gonna trust? So if you just feed and you don't, don't tell me which one you have picked out of these four, I will never be able to compare your result because then it will not make any sense because each of these method here, bisector, bisector, BCAS, OLS, Kelly's, uh, uh, I forget the name, <laughs> and this is in the numerical recipe, they have their intrinsic assumption of how the points are distribution. You must follow this assumption, otherwise the result is total garbage. Now, if you use these four different uh, fading methods, and you see that the, the distribution actually ranges from mililinear to nonlinear, right? This is for one case. Now, since I'm exploring the sensitivity of the power index as a function of diffuse fraction, as I told you that, I think this is the most uh, uh, notorious culprit in this whole business. Let's, let's, let's uh, re I mean, let me replot this figure. Now, the power index as a function of diffuse fraction, yeah? But here, the four measurement given by four stars. So instead of line, I'm just giving you a number with a star in it. And this dispersion is the dispersion from, uh, dispersion that is coming from different feeding method, yeah? So I just, just, how do you say it? I just replot it and make it, make it more convenient for you. So now, it will be easier for me to show you how the power law index varies with the change of the diffuse fraction. So let's go to generate a map which has 50% diffuse emission. I subtract it and, 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 and do it, and do the whole analysis. Then 45%, 45% uh, belongs to that contour I showed you, which is the magenta color. Somehow it looks red here. And then if you keep doing it, and then you will see some something, and if the diffuse component is not sensitive, if, if the study of the power, uh, uh, star formation uh, uh, law doesn't depend on the diffuse emission, then I will expect 
that it will stay like this. If it does in some crazy ways, then it might come fall from here to there. And these are two horizontal lines. I just give you some representative numbers for the linear law, for the nonlinear law. These are some physical meaning attached to it. So let's see what happens when you bring all of them together. See, where the diffuse fraction is dominated, right? Significant, subdominant, and negligible. So you see, the index of power law, of this transformation law, actually depends very sensitively on how you tackle your diffuse component. Because you know that diffuse component exists, but you don't know whether it's related to your star, with, with your star forming H2 region or not. Now, the, the, the reason that we saw a difference between Kenny Kett's 2007 and Big Hill et al. 2008 is, is how they treated its, this diffuse component. Big Hill et al. assumed that whatever I see in my galaxy mass is coming from my H2 region, so I bring them in. I will not subtract anything. The total emission is from the H2 region. Whatever I'm seeing is basically the leakage, so let's stick to the leakage bring and, and don't subtract anything. So they, they were able to generate a linear, a linear star formation law. On the other hand, Kennegan knew it from his 20 years of experience. There's two different things. We have to tackle it some way. So he subtract some amount, which gave him a, a power of 1.4, 1.6. Now this is the result which is consistent, which, which is uh, uh, derived for H alpha plus 24 micro. Let's see what happens when I, ha when I bring all the other stars. So you this self-consistent, right? You're, when you take the, when you subtract out the diffuse component and you measure the star formation uh, rate, you're measuring from that subtracted component, and then you're plotting. You're not taking a uh, ab initial star formation rate and then subtracting out the... No, uh, yes. So I first generate, I first try to figure how much diffuse component it has using the median filter. And, and, and then I subtract it and I work with the remaining part and then I combine them. And that, and, and that, that, that this result is coming from those residuals. So, so if, if, if diffuse component is critical, then it will also show up in ultraviolet and 24 micron or, or in some other uh, combination of uh, tracers, right? So I'm, I'm going to change this figure again. So instead of points, I'm going to show you uh, a line. So the same plot, actually. So this, uh, this orange here is this uh, dispersion in the measurement from H alpha plus 24 micro. Now I'm comparing. Now I, I took it as a, as a default, and I'm just com I'm bringing a different, uh, some other star formation rate tracer and see how do they behave. And then you see that a few plus 24 micron also behave similarly to H alpha plus 24 micron. They behave similarly in a way that if you do not subtract anything, when you consider that all the emission is coming from H2 region, you get a linear relationship. Yeah? But if you subtract, if you try to poke this diffuse component, that will, it's like a, that will change your life from linear to non-linear. -non now, if you are skeptic, you might say, well, you know, you see, I see it's like one-ish. And it's like 1.2-ish, uh, so it's not a big difference, right? So, I mean, but it's up to you how to, how to explain this, uh, uh, this, this, this uh, result. Now, bringing uh, other star from ray tracer is the H-alpha, which is extinction corrected H-alpha. It's the most notorious one because we actually do not know how the extinction is actually distributed in the galaxy disk. So this, this, this star formation ray tracer gives the wildest variation in the feeding because it has the highest dispersion in the, in the data point. And the best and the of all is the 24 micron, nonlinear 24 micron proposed by Kelzadi et al., where the dispersion is pretty low even if you subtract a significant amount of diffuse component and the dispersion stays pretty low. It's because 24 micron actually traces uh, gas density better than the, any other uh, star formation rate tracers. That's why you see intrinsically smaller dispersion. Intrinsically smaller dispersion gives us small range in feeding. So when the points try to cluster together, your life is safer because no matter which feeding method you use, you tr they, they try to be consistent. And if it is a Gaussian distributed, uh, if the points are Gaussian distributed, you even 
live in, the, in, in, in heaven. If everything is sweet. So now every, all the star forms from the tracer are brought here. And uh, so the, the, just to show you the variation in it, that, that feeding actually depends how you treat the diffuse component. And the, my whole presentation is actually based on, on, on I mean, uh, nailing down N. Because if you can figure out N, you can go back and do your calculation and, 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 and figure out the star formation efficiency or star formation time that I show in my second or third slide. That's basically it. And the conclusion is that if someone says that the power law index for the star for Smith Kennegan law is 1.5, now you know that you have a reason to ask him a question. How did he do it? And uh, you know, what's the methodology? And also, you need to know which star formation rate that person has used, uh, star formation rate tracer the person has used, and uh, what type of feeding method that the person has used. So th this is just a uh, just just the, the the whole. I haven't brought any physics in it because almost everyone is familiar with the physics. Is that either is uh, if it is n equals one, then um, you know. The internal process dominate. If it's greater than uh, one, then external process like gravity dominates. And a different school of thought are actually actively working on that. So I was just trying to understand the whole uh, whole uh, complexity of star formation from the data. Do I understand the data better? Do do I have any idea what's going on here? So that was the motivation of of this whole project. And we're going to continue with this on the with other galaxies that sting sting survey. That's it. Ha, ha, ha.